For those of you who would like to move forward, please do, uh, so we can have a more intimate conversation. Uh, and while you're deciding what to do, I just want to give a slightly more elaborate introduction to our, our guests. Um, it's really a great pleasure to have these three uh, experts um, speaking to us today. Uh, I'll begin with Wendy Law Yon, uh, who's wonderfully detailed and evocative books on Burma, including A Daughter's Memoir of Burma, Golden Parasol, The Road to Wanting, Iravadi Tango, and The Coffin Tree. Um, uh, Azim Ibrahim, uh, Research Professor of Strategic Studies uh, at the Strategic Studies Institute, Senior Fellow at the Center for Global Policy, uh, did his PhD at the University of Cambridge, uh, and, and then at Kennedy School at Harvard. Uh, and he has uh, two books, The Rohingyas um, and Radical Origins um, on um, uh, Islamic radicalism. Um, and then we have um, Adrian Levy, um, a journalist and filmmaker who also writes for The Guardian, uh, and who has dealt with a number of critical events and crisis situations, including Burma, Russia, Pakistan, and Cambodia. And his books include um, The Amber Room, The Meadow, and The Siege on the Bombay, Mumbai attacks of 2008, famously. So let me begin with a question I'll ask uh, each one of you to address in turn, um, which has to do with uh, something Adrian actually suggested, the nature of insurgency itself. Um, uh, you know, this, this uh, panel is called Exile and Insurgency. And those two terms now seem a bit odd placed next to each other mm. uh, because exile still retains a kind of 19th, even 18th century um, mm. uh, 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 you know, sense to it. Uh, and insurgency has moved very rapidly on uh, since that time. Uh, since we are going to be talking about insurgencies, I wonder if you might, each one of you, say something about how you think that term uh, and what it refers to has changed. Adrian, do you want to? Yeah, um, I was thinking about this in a, in, in, in a post 9-11 um, context, um, uh, especially um, concerning uh, more, more, more recent work. But if one broadly um, sees um, insurgencies as, as people who are opposed to government or government systems, um, one also has to broaden that out to incorporate right now uh, data, digital, digital insurgency, whistleblowing, uh, you know, everything from, um, you know, Mitrochkin, um, uh, through to Edward Snowden, in a sense, is a kind of insurgency, whether that's against the FSB, GRU, or whether that's against the NSA, CIA. Um, and so, and, and the power of data to move, actually, um, uh, and the harm that it, can, that, that it can cause when wielded against the government, obviously, is something that we need to factor into our definitions of what insurgency may be. But also, um, it's the insurgent stroke terrorism uh, thing. We were talking about this very briefly backstage. And um, it's this idea of... Um, of the politicization of the word. The word that we choose often um, defines how we mm. perceive the movement or intend to marginalize it in the public view. So for example, uh, it, you know, it's very convenient to see um, Al-Qaeda, um, which is something that I've spent a long time looking at generically as Al-Qaeda, and then to see it as a prescribed organization that is a terrorist organization rather than understanding uh, from their perspective, what the different shades and hues are, what, what the divisions and splits are, what the narratives are within the organisation, stuff that could help fuel an understanding and lead to some kind of reconciliation or an end to violence, for example. Uh, Wendy, any...? I was actually thinking of the various connotations of um, um, insurgencies and insurgent, um, not just... Um, you know, in relation to current um, connotations, but just the, the, the semantics of it. I mean, um, somehow, or some, some, someone has said that um, comparing it to a revolutionary, for example, a revolutionary is someone who is um, on our side and the insurgent is on the other side. Mm. And then you have, you have this, um, uh, when you look at the actual the, the, the language of it, a revolution is, you think of a wheel and you think of it sort of a, a contained movement within a wheel. And an insurgent is someone who rises towards something again. So there's always been a, 
a, a negative connotation to it in surgeons. But I think that um, um, I come from Burma, and Burma has an inexhaustible supply of insurgencies. <laughs> so I think uh, a lot about what that um, narrative about Burma's insurgencies mean. And one, um, I think, a great um, fallacy in thinking about um, the, 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 the Burmese insurgency problem. I mean, we all know that they are something like um, you know, there are the eight main insurgent groups and 20 groups that have not signed the peace accord. But people don't understand that in addition to that conflict, there are something like thousands of militias. And some are government integrated, some are non-government right. integrated, some of the ethnic armed organization militias. And they're all, um, you know, fighting various in various alliances. But what I think, you know, we, we get to the uh, the the, um, uh, the typography of um, uh, terrorists, and what I think people are missing is that the Burmese regime is not fighting insurgencies. The Burmese regime is keeping alive insurgencies. It's their lifeblood. They are committed, duty-bound to keep insurgencies alive. alive. And um, I would argue that the terrorists in Burma, the terrorists, they're not the, Muslim, the most recently, the Muslim uh, you know, global, global jihad terrorism that they fear, or the terrorism of the ethnic armies. I argue that the true terrorist in Burma is the state. Mm -hmm. It's a terrorist state. So just turning to Azim, I just want to pick up on something you said, because it seems to me that mimicry is actually something very important in this mm. uh, equation, mm. that the states often imitate insurgents mm. and insurgents imitate the states. Mm. So if you were to look at the 2008 attacks on Mumbai, for instance, mm -hmm. it seemed to me when they were happening, almost as if you have people who are imitating counterterrorism operations. Mm -hmm. Because mm. how do you actually secure a large part mm -hmm. of a city? A large part of South Bombay, mm -hmm. um, and keep it as it was secured mm -hmm. for some time, but to no ostensible purpose apart from displaying the virtuosity, your ability to do it. But it seems to be almost some kind of imitation of counterterrorism. So this, you know, insurgency has changed, mm -hmm. but I suppose so has the state's forms of violence. And in a way, they seem to be much closer to each other than we often imagine. Does that strike mm -hmm. you as being? Yeah. Um, I, I think w w one, one of the difficulties uh, with this conversation is that there is no universally agreed definition of terrorism or insurgency. Yeah, so, um, uh, and because of that, you know, they are used very loosely and when, when they're used with a context, it's almost meaningless. And I think you're absolutely right when you suggest that how insurgency is mimicry, mimicking the, the apparatus of a state. A very good example of this is not just Bombay, it's actually much more recently, you have the organization of Hezbollah, who's been operating in Syria you know, for the last number of years. You, know, you have about 15,000 fighters. They have evolved dramatically from a terrorist organization into a professional military that can now capture and hold territory, something that they were not able to do before. And this is obviously deeply concerning to the Israelis because they have now battle-hardened fighters who have this ability to actually hold on to territory, which is not the characteristic of a terrorist organization that engages in guerrilla type kind of warfare. So the whole evolution of this is now changing. And this is why it's concerning to the Israelis in particular, because uh, you know many experts are seeing this is going to be the next flashpoint between Iran and mm. Israel. And now you have this now uh, terrorist organization that is now essentially operating mm. like a mainstream army. There's an interesting, um, there's an interesting um, line that you can draw through that because with, with the point of mimicry and obfuscation um, and, the, and the notion of the terrorist state or, or, the, or the states that sustain um, insurgencies, um, part, of, uh, part of the way that's done is by preventing there being an analysis of an insurgency. So a good example post 9-11 um, post 
um, is the way in which the narrative has been very tightly controlled. So, for example, publicly accessible documents are few and far between, and those that existed um, in archives in the States um, for quite a while were removed from um, public view. So the, um, the NDU, had uh, the National Defence University and other places had access to documents which were then reclassified, um, in fact, during the Obama period, and there, there became a tight, a tight path uh, that was taken to present the narrative in one particular way. Whereas, um, you know, as we, as we dug deeper um, into the insurgencies um, and into the crises, what you learn is that the official narrative is a very, very long way away from the actual historic narrative of what's happened with those movements. A really good example is the, um, the drumbeat for the war in Iraq. Um, the building up um, of all of that crisis in 2003, where you have WMD and you have Al-Qaeda being sheltered by Saddam Hussein. And yet what was known within the White House exactly at that moment was that Iran and the Quds Force were sheltering the entire military council of Al-Qaeda, most of bin Laden's family. Um, and, um, you know, they were doing it as an, in a non-sectarian way to use them as gambit pieces with negotiations um, with, 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 the, with the US. But that narrative undermined Cheney's narrative of, uh, of, of Saddam Hussein being, being, being failed. And so the need to understand the granular detail mm. of, of what movements are, who they are, um, and what they tell us um, is so important because they often are memorialists. They record their own history brilliantly. Mm. So, you know, it's almost as if you're in a situation where the states when they battle insurgencies, whatever they call insurgencies, become more and more insurgent like themselves, mm. you only have to think of the setting up of Guantanamo Bay as a place literally outside the law. Uh, and the insurgencies become more and more state-like in some fashion. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the copying by ISIS mm. of Guantanamo Bay style, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sartorial, if I can put it that way, habits, those orange jumpsuits and all mm. the So, you know, there's a kind of interesting mirroring going on which tells you that they are linked in all kinds of ways, yeah, yeah. and that they change together, they stand and fall together. Uh, but I just wanted to move to um, the way in which uh, media attention focuses, the way in which it focuses on particular crisis situations, often actually does so in a way that uh, eviscerates or invisibilizes their history. So since all of you have done work on Burma, you know, it strikes me that the focus on the Rohingya, entirely merited though it is, mm -hmm. tends to remove that situation from the longer history of, uh, if you will, regional nationalist movements, not that the Rohingya even had one, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but of um, uh, um, uh, xenophobia, mm -hmm. the way in which in 1962, for instance, Indians and Pakistanis, uh, many of them are forced out of the country, the way in which the Indian Northeast and uh, militancy there might be linked to what's happening in Burma, the Kachin in particular. And of course, recently we have seen the Burmese army in that part of the country mm. also. Um, and because we have focused so much on very simple narratives of victims and perpetrators mm. and argue only on who is who, uh, we tend to lose sight of this. And do you think it actually prevents us from actually not just thinking about the situation appropriately, but of attempting to resolve it, that actually it might be much more important to de-signify the figure of the victim, uh, to de-exceptionalize the figure of the victim. Uh, want, Wendy, do you want to? I, I wonder if I can jump the gun a little yes, bit because I'm, I'm hoping we'll get to the, the, uh, the subject of genocide. But there's, um, um, there's just a little passage I'd like to read you from. I've been thinking a lot, of course, um, in comparison with the last genocide, the last big genocide of our time, which was the Rwanda crisis. Mm -hmm. And um, the, one of the, the best books written on it by Filip Gurevich mm -hmm. has this passage. Um, and he's talking about this very thing, about how language might actually end up doing a disservice. And he says, um, We imagine it's a greater crime to kill 10 than one, or 10,000 than 1,000. Is it? Thou shalt not kill, says the commandment. No number is specified. The death toll may grow, and with it a horror, but the crime doesn't grow proportionally. When a man kills four people, he isn't charged with one count of killing four, but with four counts of killing one and one and one and one. 
He doesn't get one bigger sentence, but four compounded sentences. And if there's a death penalty, you can take his life just once. Mm. But, and this is, I think, the, the key uh, point, body counts aren't the point in a genocide, a crime for which, at the time, sorry, um, what distinguishes genocide from murder and even from acts of political murder that claim as many victims is the intent. Mm -hmm. The crime is wanting to make a people extinct. The idea is the crime. No wonder it's so difficult to picture. To do so, you must accept the principle of the exterminator and see not people, but a people. You know, it, it, this makes me recall a, a recent article by the Indian anthropologist Arjuna Padurai. You know, he in, published in India. And he writes, interestingly, that there, there are different ways in which states deal with populations they consider inconvenient or threatening. Mm -hmm. And one is where you actually need those people to be there. Mm -hmm. That is to say, mm. your own, what he calls, paranoid form of sovereignty requires uh. the presence of those people. Uh -huh. You don't actually want to eliminate them. You will persecute them. You will uh -huh. uh, deprive them of rights. You will subject them to all manner of indignity. Mm. But they need to be there. Mm. Uh, there is another one which requires the absence of those yeah. people mm. through genocide, ethnic cleansing, uh, 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 whatever, you, whatever term you prefer. Uh, and then he points out that Actually, in that latter case, very often it's the populations that actually don't pose a threat mm. or that are quite small in numbers mm. Uh, mm. That, uh, that allow that, mm. that form of violence to happen. Yes. So he has a book called Fear of Small Numbers, you know, that it's precisely this idea that there are so few of them mm. uh, that you can actually achieve your goal by just either driving them out or killing them all. Mm. Um, and there's a complete mismatch between the apparent threat perception and the reality mm. of it. So it makes me think of, you know, since you mentioned 9-11, Adrian, mm. that the, if you will, what is called Islamophobia mm. in the United States has increased as the threat has decreased. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you know, it has nothing to do with any threat. Mm. When there was a threat, when there was a perceived threat, there wasn't that kind of Islamophobia. You know, does this work in Burma? How does that, you know, whether you think about the Kachin or the mm -hmm. Rohingya, does it, Adrian, do you want to begin? Well, I, I wondered, listening, listening to you um, about, and listening to your idea about the state in terror, um, whether, whether or not um, it, a lot of that comes back to the formation of the modern state with, with, with Burma, when we can go way back before then. But if we look at the Aung San period onwards, um, there's this notion um, of, of the way it's told in the West in particular and the relationship between the West and Burma, which is profoundly colonial, of course. And so the Burmese story is told about Burmans. Um, and it's a reference to, um, to um, the, the Burmese in particular and not to the ethnic groups that... Circ that, that Majoritarian. That circ the majority that, cir that, 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 that circumscribed the, um, uh, geographically um, the area controlled by Burmese. And then, of course, it became even more reduced because it became a conflict between Aung San Suu Kyi and a group of faceless generals with various acronyms that were always referred to as Orwellian. Mm. So, um, you know, there's something which um, we uh, lately describe as the North Korean Balkany Syndrome, where you have a lot of faces and you don't know who any of them are. Yeah. Um, and everyone points to them and says, look at these bad people, and yet um, there's no nuance in description, um, there's no variation um, in terms of politics or understanding. And that was happening with the Burmese conflict in that it was very much reduced to the enmity between one woman mm -hmm. who was always described in grossly colonial terms mm -hmm. uh, because of her connections to Oxbridge and the naming of her children and her relationship with Michael, um, and then the, uh, the regime in itself. And that, if anything, inhibited in many ways, a deep, profound understanding of what Myanmar, Burma was and is. Um, and also, I think it abnegated quite often the rights of the ethnic groups that surrounded it that became simply a Christian struggle story. Mm -hmm. So if you're physically on the ground and you're on the Thai border, the people who were there previously were missionaries mm -hmm. who were exchanging Bibles for food and semi semi-armed groups. I remember meeting a rangers group who were former American special services who were also converting, but they were converting then and giving military training to the Karen, the Kareni and other groups. So I felt always there was this obfuscation um, and that the, the, the Burma was misrepresented in that way. I don't know what you Well, it served, I mean, it served the military government 
very well to right. have uh, to, to have the mm -hmm. um, you know the the conflict just kind of um, distilled into this you know very simplistic thing. But yeah. I think now, since uh, especially in the last several years, and also as a you know as the result of Aung San Suu Kyi being discredited. I mean, the world's attention has been turned. There have been a lot more studies. About, and I think people do understand a lot more about what's going on now. But um, I think, you know, the, the, it's, you, you can't get beyond the, um, um, well, I should say one thing. The interesting thing is that for so long, it was easy to cast this. It was very clear to see who were wearing the black hats in Burma. Mm. And for years and years, it was, you know, this oppressed population and this dictatorship. And now, what's interesting is that this whole population that were the victims, for the first time, the army has been, is, is very much won the support of the people because of this, mm. uh, the, the, mm. the Rohingya pogroms. Mm. And so by the, uh, has, has Aung San Suu Kyi. Mm -hmm. um, the popularity has really mm -hmm. spiked. Mm -hmm. So there's this other very depressing phenomenon of a huge population being um, mm -hmm. on the side of, um, you know, this, 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 well, fundamentalism and racism, garden variety and rampant. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But there's also, and I want to ask this to you particularly, is in, you know, the recent Amnesty report yeah. on the massacre of Hindus. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, by Rohingya, apparently. Yeah. Now, what do you think is going, I know there's, it's been disputed, but yeah. uh, uh, what interests me is the reason why it shocks us so much is because we tend to think of victims as virtuous mm -hmm. mm. necessity, mm -hmm. whereas there's no reason to think that. You know, in other words, mm. they needn't be virtuous in order to be victims, mm -hmm. and their lack of virtue does not prevent us mm -hmm. from defending them when they are, you know, and yeah. it's this focus on the agency-lessness yeah. of victims that is yeah. particularly galling. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. You know, I, the, the Amnesty report essentially indicated that there was a militant group uh, representing the Rohingya, ARSA, the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, that undertook a massacre of Hindus and uh, the mass graves were discovered and so on. Like, I have absolutely no problem to believe that ARSA may have engaged in this kind of behavior. However, I, I have read the Amnesty report. The difficulty I have with the Amnesty report, and I, and I say this with all honesty as an independent academic, if one of my students had produced something like that, I would have to tell them to revise it. You know, I would tell them to put the, mm -hmm. I would tell them they have to put the necessary caveats in. Because mm -hmm. essentially Amnesty, what happened is the Hindus that they interviewed initially were in the Bangladesh camps in Cox Bazaar, and all of them gave the same story, that there was black uh, individuals dressed in black that came to our village and they murdered uh, you know, a number of Hindus uh, in, in these mass graves and put them in these mass graves, and uh, the elements of the Burmese military present as well. Now, those same Hindus were selected and repatriated back to Myanmar. Mm -hmm. And in Myanmar, they gave the same interviews again over the phone with the military acting as the middlemen. Mm. So facilitating the interviews, and they changed their stories completely. Mm. Yeah, so they now were saying, look, they were actually Rohingya individuals. So mm. none of those interviews were taken undertaken face to face from mm. that point. Yeah, so you know it could be possible. You know, maybe they, f whilst they were in Cox Bazar in Bangladesh, they feared for their lives, mm. surrounded by these Rohingya, so they were not willing to attribute blame to them. Mm. Uh, that could be a possibility. But at the same time, you know. But if you do not put the necessary caveats in and you draw a definitive conclusion, you know, that's essentially it's intellectual <coughs> laziness. Mm -hmm. you know, so. I, and I think, excuse me, also, um, the fact that Amnesty was able to get into yeah. Central Rakhine, yeah. the Ministry of Defence had to arrange yeah. that. Mm. Yeah. So there's yeah, and access is yeah. so restricted. You know, mm -hmm. I've briefed members of the US Congress and senior members of the US Senate who could not get access you know, they told me that they are visiting and they've got the green light from Aung San Suu Kyi and so on. And then, you know, when I met them after their trip and they say, look, nobody gave us access. Yes. You know, so access is so restricted. So one has to ask why was access given mm -hmm. to, you know, those, uh, to these areas for amnesty. So those, I'm not saying that the report is, uh, you know, is, uh, is wrong, <laughs> but I'm saying it is flawed from an academic perspective if you do not put those necessary caveats in it. 
And there, there were other elements <coughs> of spin that later came along as well, like uh, uh, pe people who wanted to insert um, Islamic State into the crisis. So there yeah. was a, like a, a Daesh flavour that arrived. Yeah. And then yes. there was a Lashkar Toiba flavour, which is a really great <laughs> yes. one. Yes. Yes. And uh, it was like all of yes. the bad guys from around the world were suddenly yes. all in Cox's Bazaar, you know, <laughs> with their backpacks on. And, um, and there was a good way for other states that had internal problems to point to their bad guys too yes. and say that they were... And actually, it was just Muslim crime. It was Islamic crime generally taking place. Yeah, I mean, I think what's fa it's fascinating, because when this, you know, the Amnesty Report came out, I remember thinking to myself, the context is fascinating precisely because there is no serious or credible mm. evidence of any Islamic insurgent, mm. uh, Islamic militant behavior or even support that yeah. ARSA has been trying yeah, yeah. for a long yeah. time to gain yes. support. Yeah. And in a way, it's fascinating when you compare it to what's been happening in Syria and Iraq. Mm. Yeah. You know, there you have had an apparently sectarian divide, yeah. right? Shia, Sunni, but also Alawite and others. Yeah. Uh, that's obviously not the case in Burma. Uh, and in Burma, it's only states that are involved. So for their own reasons, the yeah. Turks are very interested. Mm. You know, the yes. uh, Turkish uh, president's uh, wife was in Bangladesh distributing and promising away. The Indonesians, the Pakistanis, etc. Saudis. Uh, uh, Saudis, they're all involved. But what is singularly lacking is Islamic militancy yeah. or indeed even yeah. Yeah. Islamism. Yeah. And I find that quite fascinating for other reasons. Uh, yeah. So Burma... You know, something is happening in Burma which has to be Burma's own history yes. and with the coming out of a military dictatorship, clearly. But there's something happening in Burma and Bangladesh which also has a kind of global yes. dimension to it. And in a way, that has to do with the absence of both Islamist and, if you will, Islamic militant mm -hmm. influence and the return of the state mm -hmm. to, uh, to power. And I find that quite fascinating. Yes. Is, yeah. is that something... Uh, you know, I wonder if you'd say something about what's happening geopolitically. Mm. Uh, I, know, think you, they... I think you've made a really good point. I think I think that all of those different flavours are poisonous and actually have helped to uh, help to create a fog around the crime. Um, and um, at, at this time, I, I wonder about that whole um, notion of um, sectarianism. I wonder about it. Um, the, the reason I say that is if we broaden the picture out broadly um, to, to the region. Um, uh, and uh, I'll give you two examples of things that are happening right now which, um, which talk against the idea mm. of um, the, Shuni, the, the Sunni Shia divide, for example. Um, the, the Russians are back uh, funding yeah. in Afghanistan, mm. and the people they're funding are Islamic State. Yeah. And the Islamic State cells, uh, which are propagated very successfully, are receiving two kinds of funding. One that's coming from Quds Force, from Iraq, the Iranian side, and the other from the Russian side that want to destabilise American interests in Afghanistan and push back uh, on India's uh, ambitions mm. Um, in Afghanistan. Um, so, you know, talk, think again about the Haqqani network and the Duran line and all of that force coming up from, from Pakistan. No, it's coming from a different direction. Mm. So that, that, that talks against, that, that talks to the fungibility of political ambition mm. rather than this great notion of um, the sectarian divide. One other thing, historically, um, if you look at the growth of um, uh, the most bloody period of the war on terror when Zarqawi mm. really, really took, mm. took hold, um, and uh, slow down America um, in Iraq. When you go to those people um, who fought with him, what they tell you is that the movement and him were enabled by Iran. Mm. Mm. So he'd come from a period where he bloodily had purged, yeah, yeah. bloodily, bloodily had purged Hazaras, yeah. uh, and, and the Shia purge had been really forceful, mm. and yet it was Iran that held him in Evan prison along with a 100 other comrades. They armed them, they, 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 they made sure they were well, they gave them their jabs, and then they released them overland through Kurdistan into, uh, into Baghdad to slow down the American advance. So the deeper we go into movements, what we see is these apparent contradictions. And the larger story told to the public through um, more general writing is of an internal mm. conflict yeah. in Islam between uh, you know, Sunni and Shia. And actually, it couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah, it's it's you know, classic real politic in some sense. Absolutely. And what's missing is the failed state and the rogue state, well, rogue state maybe, but the kind of failed state A absolutely. premise, which is yeah. you know, extraordinary. Yeah. Are we, do we have to? Ah, sorry. Um, yeah, so I, you know, just staying with the victim mm. for a while, mm. since it's so, uh, it's become entirely conventional for us to think about victims and their virtue as opposed to perpetrators and their evil, which is no real way of considering anything. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, I'm reminded of um, Gandhi's um, statement that the victim actually has no moral status at all. Mm. 
well, yeah. uh, yeah. that the moral, sta the moral status only belongs to hmm. that person who is a moral agent, who can do something. Uh, and doing something <coughs> is better than doing nothing. Hmm. And yet, in our world, we attribute virtue only to those who are victims, mm -hmm. who apparently suffer in passive uh, fashion. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm, uh, you know, this is a slightly excessive thing I'm saying, mm -hmm. but I'm just wondering whether one way of dealing with these apparently intractable issues is to get out of the language of victimization, not to say it doesn't exist, that people aren't being killed, that there isn't genocide, mm -hmm. but to actually think about moral and political agency in more complicated ways. I mean, how would you, for instance, say something about the Rohingya, mm. which is not simply that they are the hapless victims of uh, ethnic cleansing or genocide, especially in a situation where we already have a history of genocide in this region, in Bangladesh, mm. what is then yeah. East Pakistan, which is never brought up in any of the Boom. commentary on this matter. It's another example of how history is cut and you know, chopped to pieces to actually prevent you from understanding mm. what's happening. Well, Wendy? I think it, it has a lot to do doesn't it, with proportionality. And I think it's harder to talk about, you know, the sort of, you know, about victimization in relative terms. When um, the Rohingya, for example, the, it's harder to imagine, it's hard to imagine a more disenfranchised, yes. a more impoverished, and, you know, so many of them are illiterate. Mm. So when you talk about agency and so on, it's, you have to keep in mind, I mean, what, what, have, what have they, even if you remove the subject of victimization, what, mm. what recourse have they had? Mm. And the fact that um, ASA has rose up is, is, not, is not surprising, but it's a function of its kind yes. of a desperation mm. that has... Um, you know. It's when agency cannot be yes. claimed that you have this kind of. That's right. Yeah. yeah. You know. You know. You know. A common question is that why has the you know this is now arguably the greatest humanitarian crisis in the world. You had uh, over one one million people now living in Bangladesh and one of the largest refugee camps in the world. And I've been there many times myself, and it's an astonishing sight. You can literally climb the highest hill, mm. and uh, everywhere you look around you, it's just a sea of humanity. And, uh, you know, and when the monsoon season comes, you know, many of those people are mm. going to be wiped out. You know, I was, with, I was at a meeting in, in Washington recently with USAID, and they were saying that their numbers are mm. minimum 50,000 will be killed mm. in the monsoon <coughs> season. And the people mm. are li literally living in, uh, in, in shacks. So why has there been so little inaction from the international community in mm. this crisis? And it touches upon Wendy's point is that the, when you meet with the Rohingya, you, there's one thing that you realise is that these people are literally the lowest of the low that you could ever come across. You know, they have been described by the UN as the most persecuted minority in the world. They've also been described as the forgotten the forgotten people. Mm. There's hardly anybody amongst them with a basic education. Mm. You know, they can't advocate for themselves domestically, let alone internationally. Mm. Right, to give you an example, I recently met a lady in Chicago who teaches the Rohingya, some Rohingya mm. refugees. She teaches them English language. And she said it's so difficult to teach them English because most of them don't know their own language mm. and most of them don't know how to hold a pen. So you have these adults who have never actually held a pen. they don't even have a written language. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. And, 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 this, and this is the difficulty. So you, you cannot advocate for them. Mm -hmm. They can't advocate for themselves. And, I, and you know, I, I've given presentations on this uh, in the public domain before. And I always ask, tell the audience that, look, all of you have obviously come here to hear a talk on the Rohingya. So you're clearly interested mm -hmm. in the topic. You know, but I bet not a single one of you can name me a single Rohingya person. You know, and mo mo none of them ever can. You know, if I were to make a, uh, mention another cause to you, the, the you know the Palestinian cause or something, you'd name me Yasser Arafat, Mahmoud Abbas, or Edward Said, or yeah, Bella Hadid, a supermodel. Yeah. You know, this, these people are literally nowhere to be seen. You know, there's no NGOs. Like I, I, I gave a briefing to a, a, a U.S. Congresswoman, and uh, she asked me. She said, oh, "I'd like to meet with the Rohingya leadership." 
<laughs> it's <laughs> Arthur. Yeah, there's no ringleader leadership. They don't have an office in K Street in Washington. These people, can, they don't, they can't represent yeah. themselves. Yeah. You know, so that's that's one of the reasons why there's been very very little inaction. Another principal reason is actually because China has has geopolitical interest in that region. You know, China is the largest investor in Myanmar. If you know Southeast Asia, you know China is essentially buying up so much of the real estate in that region because they have an insatiable demand mm. for resources. Pakistan is a good example of this. China is the biggest investor in Pakistan through CPAC. And it's exactly the same in Myanmar. Mm. Access to Myanmar gives uh, China access to the Indian Ocean and avoiding the, you know, uh, uh, the access to the Indian Ocean, avoiding the Straits of Malacca. Mm. Before, Ch China has global, uh, global superpower ambitions. But before it can become a global superpower, <coughs> it must become a regional power. And that means keeping its regional rival <coughs> India in check. You know, so that's so you have much more kind of geopolitical machinations going on, and you know President Obama visited Myanmar a number of times, um, uh, 2012, and uh, you know for any country to get a visit from the President of the United States is a big deal, and the reason why he visited was because he was concerned it's falling under the sphere of influence of China. So essentially, you have these geopolitical machinations going on behind the scenes, and then you insert this minority group called the Rohingya, who's nobody's ever heard of. It simply doesn't fit into that equation. You know, you, you, uh, and I'm glad you mentioned the role of China in there because that makes India's uh, lackadaisical attitude even more puzzling. Mm. Given mm. that that's the big Asian, co you know, competition going mm. on, uh, and you know, if but also it raises questions about Bangladesh and Turkey and Indonesia and all these states. Mm. When you think of the last genocide, which is that of Bangladesh during the Bangladesh War. 12 million people were refugees in India. Mm. They mostly went back after mm. the end of it. Okay, there was a leadership, yeah. but there was a much more brutal mm. killing yeah. happening in East Pakistan. Precisely because India actually, mm. under Indira Gandhi, uh, <coughs> decided to intervene in a decisive manner um, yeah. and did so in a way that didn't involve the international community in. Uh, in any major way, because that would have just fractured everything, mm. uh, that problem could be resolved. Uh, here, you have all kinds of states. India seems to be not particularly concerned. There's a you know, history of Rohingya camps in India being burnt down mysteriously. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's one quest part of the puzzle. The other part of the puzzle is Turkey, Indonesia, Pakistan, who all claim to be supporting mm. Muslim populations and all that, uh, you know, seem to be just making diplomatic um, uh, a table talk mm. with Myanmar. What is going on? There seem to be a lot of cooks there, but the broth <laughs> is never made, and perhaps that's because there are so many of them. Yeah. Uh, Adrian, do you want to begin with the, yeah. as it was the geopolitics of this issue? There's so much to unpick there, you know. I mean, the, I, I, I think um, you, you only realize when, when, you, when you're inside the country um, how vast and pervasive the Chinese presence is, um, and it's not new. Um, it's um, a, a well-cemented historic relationship. I mean, basically, from Mandalay North, um, I don't think you can come across an enterprise that isn't controlled or owned in some way. They're asset stripping and assaying the entire country, whether it's, you know, the waters through hydroelectric string, streams and damming, um, through jade and rubies, yes, and we've written about, and I've written yes. about those areas. And 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 I, I was just overwhelmed. And then you get to this super porous border. Um, with, 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 with southern China. Um, and it's just a, a cataract of um, illegal trade, of people trafficking. And so, and so their, their aspirations have, uh, are historic, aren't they? In the sense that if we, when we go back and we, we look at the history of Burma, they, they've, they've actually um, you know, invaded, occupied, used it as a vassal state for so many hundreds of years, so many centuries. And um, I, I think that's one of the most important pieces of the puzzle to understand um, the needs to control the resources and the offshore resources as well. Um, and I think you're right that a second piece um, 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 would be something like Wada, like um, the idea that the port in Pakistan has been facilitated, um, encourages competition with America and increases the, circular, the circling of India through the Sri Lankan ports as well. Um, and that's an enormous piece of the puzzle, the sort of the, the bigger picture. Um, and why, for example, it doesn't matter apart from pride-wise to Pakistan so much right now mm. that, uh, that they've been snubbed by the, um, the Trump administration, mm. really with Turkey and China um, coming up and stepping up uh, militarily, politically, um, 
security-wise, um, in every way, um, they are mentors and financiers. And I think the Burmese story is a shadow of what's being played in CPAC and um, across the north of Pakistan um, and its new burgeoning relationships with China, which also go back to um, the, uh, the Pakistanis being the first to recognise uh, communist mm. uh, China. I mean, that's also a very historic relationship that, that's, that's been carefully nurtured and grown. Burma was the second. Um, right, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So it's a, there's, there's a lot, um, the bigger picture's critically mm. important to understand the way in which, and, and, then, and then the reporting has been so sporadic, mm. and I think that's a lot to do with news exhaustion. Mm. Um, the Trump administration absorbs so much of our time unnecessarily, <laughs> and those, those sort of the tantrum reporting means that we're, we're, we're misdirected by the personalities, and the, you know, that's like the Berlusconi effect. Yes. You spend all the time looking at the clowning rather than actually listening to mm. what the mm. grand division is, mm. and it, it's a big problem, it's got to stop. Um, and the navel gazing that's taken place as well, I just find it offensive mm. and annoying. Um, mm. And we just need more sort of commitment to trying to find the platforms to actually, as you said, um, work that's more um, nuanced. Mm -hmm. um, my whole thing post 9-11 and actually post um, the, 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 the CG imprisonment period is more detail, not less, like more nuance, mm. not less. You know, talk, don't talk about Taliban, talk about Talibans. Mm. You know, let, let's really understand what, what the kinetic forces are that are involved mm. and don't sell people short. Mm you know, come up with the detail to back it up and, you know. Azim? Yeah. No, I, 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 I agree with, uh, with, with everything you say. You know, China, I had a meeting uh, with, in, with a very senior official in Washington and she told me explicitly, you know, uh, China is the key to all of this. <coughs> yeah, and we need China for North Korea. That's, right. that's exactly the word she said. And obviously, you indicate from that, you know, the United States has certain political capital and North Korea is obviously a serious issue for them. And they are not willing to utilise that political capital on this issue of mm. Burma and the Rohingyas. You know, mm. they're just not willing to do that. So that's the only interpretation I can take away from that. I mean, I, I remember when I met Aung San Suu Kyi mm. a few years ago when she'd come to Oxford, I made the mistake of including Burma in South Asia, which it's historically mm. on occasion has <laughs> been part of colonial India. She bridled at this suggestion and she said, certainly not part of South Asia. I'm a part of Southeast Asia. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah. so, so much for the great friendship with India, um, uh, which she professes. <laughs> so let's move to questions from the audience, mm. if we may. Uh, this one right at the back. Yes. Hi, thank you for the very interesting talk. I just wanted to ask if um, you talked about victimization and how it's assumed that the victims are innocent and so on. Will you, um, after what you've told us about the Rohingyas and how they have no agency at all at international or national levels, um, are they really the victims here then? And uh, what would you um, say about their exile? Because we didn't, I think, um, hear much about the exile part of the conversation. Thank you. Is that directed to anyone in particular? Anyone can ask. Yeah. Wendy, do you but want to? Exile in which sense? Exile of the Rohingyas as it is right now, and oh. including the victims and the causes of it and their lack of agency to represent themselves, and of course the lack of interest from any of the other countries to get involved in solving their, their plight. Mm. Well, I, I'm a little bit um, concerned about using words like exile. I mean, I, of course, it's true, exile, even words like exodus and uh, hegira, because it's nothing so exalted. It's just, uh, you know, it's a pogrom. It's a, it's a genocide. And um, so uh, it, it gives a different kind of uh, shading to the word exile. Um, but um, I think it, the question of repatriation, I think, is key now, and to look at what people are doing in order to end this exile. And the Burmese government claims that it is making uh, preparations for these uh, refugees to return. But um, they've done actually nothing to... Um, to, except build some holding uh, camps and um, 
to receive them. And they're not, I mean, how can this population come back without base, some basic safeguards? Like, uh, you know, their, their citizenship status, for one thing. What, what's to keep it from happening again? So um, I think this is the key um, mm. now, the next, I mean, the next practical thing that we have to look at, right, Azim? Yeah. Yeah, so the two parts of the question there. First of all, in terms of the Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh and the repatriation, I don't believe, you know, when this was first announced, I, I wrote a piece in the New York Times about this, I don't believe that they're going back. You know, Myanmar has spent half a century trying to get rid of these people. Now that they have finally succeeded, the probability of them taking them back is, is yeah. next to zero. Yeah, what, what Myanmar has done, and we've been there here before, 92, 93, 2012, 2013, is that they'll enter into these negotiations and agreements to buy as much time as possible until world attention moves on to the next crisis and these individuals become a permanent fixture within Bangladesh. Now, the second part of your uh, question is that what are the causes of this? And this is very interesting because, you know, why is this happening now? If you are arguing that the Rohingya have been victims of persecution for half a century, you know, why is this happening on this scale? To, you know, why did it happen in 2017? And I believe there's three reasons for this. It's very interesting when you look at genocides and the history of genocides is that uh, it is very common for the perpetrator of the genocide to undertake a dry run to undertake a test run to see what is going to be the reaction of not just the international community, but also of local actors and see if they can actually get away with it. And a similar thing happened in Rwanda. And the military undertook a dry run of this in two, September 2016, in which they burnt down dozens of Rohingya villages and expelled approximately 140,000 Rohingya uh, from uh, from Myanmar into Bangladesh. And the military learned three important lessons from that. The first lesson they learned is that Aung San Suu Kyi defends the military in public. She, has, she, become, she became a shield for all criticism against the military. For example, when the United Nations reported in 2016, I believe in March, that 52% of the Rohingya women had been raped of, of the refugees. So the majority of them had been raped. Aung San Suu Kyi said, this is fake rape. That's her words, yeah. So this is fake rape. When the BBC's Fergo Keane pressed upon her that ethnic cleansing is going on in your country, she said ethnic cleansing is far too strong a term to use. Both sides are equally to blame. So drawing moral equivalence between the perpetrators and the, and, and the victims. And when the, when the United Nations passed a resolution for a full humanitarian commission inquiry, she said this will not be very helpful. And it was her office that refused to give the visas to the UN. So she may not control the military, but she is the foreign minister of the country. She's interior, she, control, she refused to give them visas. So that was the first thing. Aung San Suu Kyi defends the military in public. The second thing the military learned is that all of a sudden the military became very popular. The military in Burma was very unpopular, which is what forced them to have elections in the first place. But after this operation against the Rohingya, they became, they became seen as the defenders of Buddhist values against these hordes of invading Muslim Bengali. So the military suddenly became very popular. And the third thing they learned is that despite all the evidence of genocide, rapes, mass killing, burning villages, etc., the military chief, General Minong Ling, was still given a VIP invitation to Europe. Austria and Germany literally rolled out the red carpet for him and they treated him as if nothing had ever happened. So the military obviously had a clear indication that, look, we can actually take this up a notch or two and execute the final solution, which is precisely what they did. Remember in Rwanda also, even as the, the, the bloodbath was going on, the French and the Belgians yeah, yeah. were still... Yeah. supporting so you know they were learning also that Absolutely, it was yeah, yeah. it was a dry run yeah. so to speak yes yeah, yeah. Mm. the questions yes gentlemen in the back hi yeah um just going a bit more on the topic of complexity how do you get public support for such a, a complex problem and a challenge where often people don't have time to understand the, the kind of details of it all I, I think it comes back to something that, that you've both said, which is which is um, uh, unpicking complicity, um, and and just and just and just refusing to step back from 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 the um, the, the layers of controversy that surround it. So I, I think um, I think directing things back at Aung San has been really important. Um, and um, one point that we haven't come up with, but we discussed um, before we came on, 
is UN complicity and the ineffectiveness Absolutely. of the UN. And I think focusing on the institutions and the individuals really helps to actually make this a real story um, rather than shying away from that. And I've not seen enough of that um, in terms of the reporting. What you see a lot is a lot of poverty pornography, which is a kind of a crying, weeping victimisation reporting, which I understand because it, it moves a mass of people to understand. But that actually is a default position, which is ultimately negative and fails in virtually every crisis unless we can understand the framework that surrounds it. So I would like to see uh, more explaining, more directing um, uh, criticism directed um, through, through in, uh, investigation um, and polemic against the UN, and particularly against Aung San Suu Kyi in terms of her role. I think we can personalize it. We can look at um, international culpability. And m my final um, suggestion is um, not to shy away from um, getting people to focus on the bigger picture, the larger canvas, because I think it explains a lot of also of what um, America is up to, what, what the Bannon worldview was before he was ousted, in fact, what the Trump administration are looking for in the region and how it stands up to competition with China. The more we can understand about that, the more informed we actually can be about the chaos in the White House right now and actually detach the strands from that to, to understanding what may happen to Rohingyas. Yeah. I, th I think that the issue of Aung San Suu Kyi is, is very interesting. You know, earlier I was speaking about one of the reasons why the international community has not intervened. And, uh, you know, I've met with many policymakers um, uh, who have told me that, uh, you know, we cannot put too much pressure on Myanmar uh, because it's a very fragile democracy. Mm. It's a flawed democracy, mm. but it's a fragile, but it's moving in the right direction mm. very slowly. And if we put too much pressure on it, then it might revert to being a military dictatorship. And nobody wants that. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, and I wrote a piece on this, the myth of a military coup. Mm -hmm. The military in Myanmar is in absolutely the perfect position that they want to be in. Aung San Suu Kyi managed to get all sanctions lifted of, 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 the, mm -hmm. of Myanmar. The military have enriched themselves dramatically. Mm -hmm. They have massive holdings in Singapore and China. And, and they Macau own all the enterprises in country. Yeah. So. And now they have the holy grail of politics. Mm -hmm. They have power without any accountability whatsoever. The probability of them going back to a military dictatorship and inviting sanctions upon themselves and international scorn, you know, is, is very little. They're probably not going to do that. And, uh, and it, Aung San Suu Kyi, you know, I, I wrote a piece in Newsweek last, last year in which I interviewed half a dozen people who have known Aung San Suu Kyi intimately for decades, including the founder of the Free Aung San Suu Kyi campaign, and another individual who used to smuggle papers to her when she was under house arrest in prison, and an Australian member of parliament who was the first Westerner to meet with her when she was released from house arrest. All of them told me on the record, and it's all printed in my, in my article in Newsweek, that Aung San Suu Kyi has always had these views. She's mm. always been a Burma Buddhist nationalist that believes that Burma is a country exclusively for the Buddhists that just happens to have these minorities within it and those minorities do not belong there. And one of the difficulties we've had trying to accept this is that the whole myth of Aung San Suu Kyi is much more to do with us than it is to do with her. Yes. You know, we in the West, we love to have our heroes on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. We love to have our heroes untarnished. Nobody wants to hear about the shortcomings of Nelson Mandela in his early days as a terrorist. Nobody wants to hear about the shortcomings of Gandhi or any. We like to have our heroes pure. And her story is one of the best stories you'll ever hear. The daughter of one of the founding generals of Myanmar, placed under house arrest by her father's former colleagues. She's beautiful, she's articulate, Oxford-educated, Nobel laureate, speaks mm. the Queen's English. Now she's out of prison, she's opening up her country. This is fantastic. This is the kind of stuff we make movies out of. And so, you know, we need this, and we make this mistake over and over again. If you remember uh, Bashar al-Assad, the London trained ophthalmologist who's going to, you know, uh, mm. who's been quoted by Tony Blair, now he's the greatest mass murderer of our time, or Saif al Gaddafi, PhD from the London School of Economics, yes. you know, or, or, or a good example, Kim Jong un, you know, trained at a, educated at a Swiss boarding school, he love, loves basketball and Disneyland. <laughs> and we fail to realize that these people are ideologically committed. You know, they believe, mm. you know, the fact they've come to the West and they've tasted Western democracy doesn't mean they're going to go back to their country and make their backward countries like our country mm. and this is just something that we like to believe but is actually not very true in reality i mean my the comparison that came to my mind was benazir bhutto <laughs> yeah. Yeah. apart from the nobel prize everything else matches mm. you know oxford daughter mm. of yeah. you know important mm. a politician etc who also didn't do much yeah. uh, when she was in power and yeah. perhaps she couldn't it was the same problem as on Kansu she faces yeah. Mm. Military, is she simply fronting the military? Is yeah. she actually struggling? Mm. 
Do we give them a chance? What about sanctions? Mm -hmm. Has democracy returned? It's exactly the same set of questions yeah. in another military Sorry. state. Yes. You know, uh, it's, um, though she did not perpetrate a genocide. Uh, uh, so you know, the example is actually very instructive because they are regional and that's important, I think, to show that this is not an exception. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That there are regional continuities and similarities mm -hmm. so that we don't make the mistake of thinking, oh, we have solved it here and now yeah. mm. that's it. Um, yes. Um, thank you for that. Uh, my question is, are there any elements in Burmese population which are actually critical of the military? And I'm talking about students or any sections within Burma, mm. because we don't hear those voices in the media. Is there any sections that don't? That are critical of the military in Burma. The voices are very weak right now. Yeah. Um, because of this whole, the, the, the crystallization around the Rohingya problem, they're very much on the defensive. And you know, people talk a lot about how uh, one of the explanations um, for this kind of uh, blinkered view that the Buddhist nationalists have is, you know, people have said, well, they've been so long mm -hmm. oppressed and cut off from, um, from um, any sources of information and history. And of course, Aung San Suu Kyi symbolizes that because for 15 years, mm -hmm. she too has been so. People say, well, perhaps they're all out of touch. But what I believe, the way in which um, Burma is the most backward and um, the, the, the most um, deprived of any kind of a, a sense of um, um, you know, enlightenment is that it clings, I mean, this is a problem of the rest of the world, it, but, but it clings to an incredibly outmoded um, idea of nationalism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we don't, all our old um, ideas of nationalism have to be re redefined now, and they haven't been. Mm -hmm. The question of borders, we don't, borders are not what's, what they used to be. And I, I think, you, you know, you've talked about this idea of sovereignty, Faisal. Yes. You know, what is sovereign anymore? It's a meaningless term now. But the, the, there are structural reasons too, I think, to be, to be, to be slightly uh, more, I don't know, generous is the right word, but there are, there are, there are structural reasons why those voices of opposition uh, may not have been galvanized or come together. I mean, if, from 1988 onwards, if we look at the decimation of the, the student democratic and the ABSDF and those student movements, the fact they became exile movements, mm -hmm. corrupt in exile and corrupted by exile. Um, the voices that were left behind were voices that were in hiding and concealed. Um, a lot of those were put through brutalized torture and insane um, and then came out as weakened old people. Yes. And that Suu Kyi was always an anti-democrat, so that the, the leadership council of um, the democratic movement was a group of old men. Yeah. Mm. Um, and all of the younger students who um, were fighting uh, to get up to that leadership level, a lot of them were brutally exiled from that organization and found no, no, no place to go there. So what you had was a fractured diaspora community that existed um, wherever they were taken. Oslo was a big location, London, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so some of the people who had those skills were then wrenched away from the country. What you were left behind was um, uh, Suu Kyi and a court of older people, much older people, um, who didn't represent, who didn't even necessarily have a constituency other than the Burman, general Burman sense of, do you think that's But fair? Adrian, the thing is, the, the, um, uh, the 88 generation, the, the core group that were yeah. uh, the leaders who are now, they have been appallingly yeah. silent. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. the exile community, well said, the yeah. privileged yeah. exile yeah. community, what have they become? They've become absentee nationalists. Mm. You know, just uh, yeah. I, I, some time ago, a long time ago, I wrote a piece um, which most people didn't understand. And I said that banishment from certain states is a form of salvation. Mm. And in the case of, <laughs> in the case of um, many of Burmese exiles, I feel that it wasn't a salvation because one of the most shocking things of the past year is, has been, for me has been to speak to them. Mm. And the um, complete syllogisms mm. that they use mm. in well first of all they don't believe it mm. or not they don't believe it they deny it mm. they deny that this is happening and they say yes but in the case of the rohingya mm. they're really bad yeah, yeah. You know? 
Mm -hmm. Wendy, do you think that the George Soros money that enabled um, ABSDF <laughs> and the, the, exiled, the exiled democratic movement, do you think that will now be ploughed um, into giving... <laughs> some, yes, yeah, some of them taken back, like the Nobel Peace yeah. Prize, you know, that yes, people that are that calling for. I'm glad it's come up. <laughs> I, I'm afraid we have to close soon. So, Azim, last word? Yeah, so no, I, I would just say that, that, you know, within Myanmar itself, the Rohingya have really no champions at all. And it is, it is quite shocking to see all the pro-democracy supporters that were with Aung San Suu Kyi during the pro-democracy struggle, many of them imprisoned for lengthy periods, even when they were interviewed by the BBC and other news agencies, and they speak about the, Ro in the Rohingya, they're almost supportive of the military and what, what the military is engaged in. The only organisation, as far as I'm aware, that's actually spoken out for the Rohingya are the Kashin uh, women's organisation. Mm. And the only reason they've spoken out is because they know they're next on the list. And, uh, you know, and, and I wrote, I wrote an, a, a piece recently in Foreign Policy magazine. It was titled, First They Came for the Rohingya. Now that the Myanmar military has successfully expunged their country of the Rohingya, they are now turning their e attention to other minorities, the mm. Karen, the Kashin, the Shan. And they have an emboldened military. They've increased operations against these minorities so they can continuously just remove them for the, from the country. Because once you open the door to one genocide, you allow one genocide to happen, you're opening the door to many others. Well, on that very sobering note, uh, please join me in thanking our three panelists.